welcome everyone here. It's been great to see you. I'm Carol Levin. I'm the director of the Medieval and Renaissance Studies Program. And I'm welcoming you all to our annual Mary Martin McLaughlin Memorial Lecture. Um, I want to mention this is just, this is our kind of high point of the fall, but we have some other wonderful programs still to come. Uh, on Monday, October 27th, in the Dudley Bailey Library, 228 Andrews Hall, Amy Gantan, who is finishing her PhD at Vanderbilt, will be talking about censorship, compromise, and nonconformity, a Puritan minister's creative strategies for publication in the audience. This is a very big thrill for us because Amy is coming back to UNL. Amy got her uh, BA and her MA here, and she was one of our star students, and her work is not only excellent, but really fascinating. You might not think that from the title, but let me promise you, it really is. And we're so thrilled to have her come back to tell us about her work and to see all that she has accomplished. So that is Monday, October 27, 5 p.m. in the Dudley Bailey Library. And then on Monday, November 10th, again in the Dudley Bailey Library, 228 Andrews Hall at 5 p.m., we will have Joel Harrington, who will speak about mo the modern invention of a medieval executioner. That sounds pretty fun and bloody too. <laughs> so we hope that you can come to one or both of those events as well. In 1940, Mary Martin McLaughlin graduated with her BA in history. She stayed and she did her MA in history too. Receiving it the next year, she was a real sprinter through her MA program, receiving her MA in 1941. She then went on to Columbia at a time when there were very few women who were working on PhDs. And she received her PhD in medieval history from Columbia she went on to a distinguished career teaching at Vassar, but she also pioneered the field of medieval women's history. We are very, very proud that Mary Martin McLaughlin, who died in 2008, is an alum of the University of Nebraska. And to celebrate Mary, every year we invite a major speaker in some area of medieval women. And to introduce our speaker today will be Julia Schlumpf. It is my sincere pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Lynn Shutters, Special Assistant Professor of English at Colorado State University. Dr. Shutters received her PhD in Medieval English Literature from New York University in 2004. She's held positions at the University of Georgia, the University of Iowa, and the Idaho and University of Michigan, working both within English departments and women's and gender studies programs. Dr. Shutter's research examines medieval literary representation of Christian Islamic relations, as well as late medieval representations of marital love. She has published articles in Comitatus, the Medieval Feminist Forum, and Chaucer Review, including Marital Affection and the Medieval Design, and most recently, Confronting Venus, Classical Pagans and their Christian Readers in John Gower's Confessio Amantis, both of which were published in the Chaucer Review. She's also published essays in the collections Masculinities and Femininities in the Middle Ages and Renaissance, Race, Class, and Gender in the Medieval Cinema, Medieval Cinema, <laughs> and Love, Marriage, and Transgression in Medieval and Early Modern Literature. She's currently finishing the epic exercise of cat herding, known as editing a volume of scholarly essays <laughs> with co-editor Karina Attar. The volume, Teaching Medieval and Early Modern Cross-Cultural Encounters, will be out with Paul Gray by the end of the year. To my knowledge, this collection is the first of its kind, uh, addressing the ways in which the upsurge in global medieval and global renaissance studies can be best brought into our classrooms and shared with students. In addition to this, Dr. Shutters is working on a full-length monograph entitled Chaucer's Pagan Women. The book triangulates Chaucer's engagement with classical antiquity, his depiction of women, and his representations of love and marriage, producing some surprising reassessments of femininity and emotion, both in and beyond Chaucer's corpus. It shows the legendary classical women, including Lucretia,
Nietzsche, Penelope, Alcini, and Alcestis are central to Chaucer's thinking about love and marriage, so much so that the presence is felt even in his account of wives who do not hail from classical antiquity. Beginning with the legendary classical women of the Book of the Duchess and the Legend of Good Women, Chaucer's pagan women traces a new pagan genealogy for the famous wives of Canterbury Tales. By demonstrating the centrality of women to Chaucer's depictions of love, the book seeks both to revitalize feminist approaches to Chaucer and to incorporate Chaucer's pagan women into larger historical reassessments of marriage and love. Dr. Shutters will be sharing with us today a part of this larger project of interest on marriage and love. And it's time that I turn the podium over to her. But before I do that, I must express my great personal pleasure that Lynn has agreed to join us here today. Our love of literature has carried us both great distances over many years and quite far from that Shakespeare seminar in New York City where we first met what seems like ages ago now. And this, that's actually my first ever graduate class. And I remember being incredibly impressed by the bold, intelligent woman who dared to speak, and so frequently, and uh, <laughs> pretty much carrying that class discussion while I watched and tried to learn. And, I'm happy to say that that feeling of deep admiration has, um, has itself only deepened with years. And so it is with great confidence and with great pleasure that I give you Dr. Lynn Shutter. Thank you for that very generous introduction and thank you all for coming you out tonight. Can you hear me okay? Is that good? Okay. So again, thank you for that very generous introduction and thank you all for coming out tonight. I'm really happy to be giving this talk. Um, so, what's got love got to do with it? Love and marriage, medieval and modern? Okay. All right, is that better? Is that good? Yeah. Okay, I think now it's it. All right, there we go. So the title of my talk is What's Love Got to Do With It? Love and Marriage, Medieval and Modern. Uh, and in this talk, I will be focusing on one medieval woman author, the French author Christine de Tizon. These dates are up there, we live from approximately 1364, 1365 to 1430-31. Um, she's a very interesting case in thinking about how we connect to and make use of women writers from the past. Uh, she's one of the most widely known medieval European women writers. I'm curious, how many people in the room have studied, taught, learned about Christina Pizan? Okay, so, um, about half. All right, so the rest of you can check that off after tonight. <laughs> um, so uh, she's um, uh, one of the most widely known uh, medieval European women writers, and she's important not just within the field of medieval studies, but also to feminist and women's studies uh, more generally. Uh, the reason for the interest in Christine de Pizan beyond, beyond the specific field of medieval studies largely is on account of um, the work, the title of which appears up here, um, Le Livre de la Cité des Dames, or the Book of the City of Ladies, which she wrote around 1405, and this is the main work I'll be addressing tonight. So I want to begin by telling you a little bit about the Book of the City of Ladies. And here's a nice image. There we go. Yes. Uh, so, uh, Christine opens this work by depicting herself sitting alone in her study. This persona, Christine, begins to read a misogynist book. So you see her on the left there in her blue dress with her book. Um, as a result, she feels completely demoralized as a woman and questions her own worth. Then three allegorical ladies, reason, rectitude, and justice, you can also see there, uh, appear and tell her that misogynist literature is all wrong. To counter misogyny, Christine must build a city of ladies. This is an allegorical city that will be built through stories. You see the image of her laying her bricks there. But again, this is allegorical. The actual act of building the city is writing the Book of the City of Ladies itself. So the Book of the City of Ladies is framed as a dialogue between this persona, Christine, and these three allegorical figures. Um, and in this dialogue with these women, um, uh, Christine ends up relating the stories of 80-some virtuous women from classical antiquity, um, the Hebrew Bible, and Christian traditions. So some of the women included in this book include the following. There are Amazons, who are women warriors who defeat Greek heroes in battle. Dido is depicted as leading her people to a new homeland, where she, and she founds a city for them. And then there are saints, including Catherine, Benedicta, 
Lisa and Christine. St. Christine is different from the, either the author or character of Christine. Uh, these saints actively preach the word of God and defeat learned male opponents in debates. So you can see how this work would appeal to feminists of later eras because it does tend to uh, feature these very um, strong and accomplished women. The first modern English translation of the Book of the City of Ladies was published in the early 80s. And it was largely as a result of this translation that US feminist academics became interested in Christine. Uh, Christine was hailed as a defender of women as a, and as a feminist avant the lettre. Uh, this is still a very common perception of her. So for example, um, his, the Harvard historian Laurel Thatcher Ulrich uh, recently, relatively recently wrote a book entitled Well-Behaved Women Seldom Make History, um, in which she hails uh, Christine de Pizon as a, an important author who defends um, we also find this portrait of Christine in more um, uh, modern um, versions of her. By the way, in case you're wondering why I call her Christine, it's not because I think she's personally my best friend or anything like that, um, but de Pizan actually just refers to the fact that her family came from Pisa, so um, we tend to refer to her in um, academic studies as Christine. Um, so, so here's, a, again, the work of a Harvard uh, um, University professor. Um, but we also see this portrait of Christine as this defender of women in more popular um, uh, sources. This is a screenshot of bio.com, a website that, as its name would suggest, includes the biographies of many famous people, both past and present. Um, and I'm particularly interested in the description of Christine de Pizan that appears um, uh, under her name there. Women's rights activist, poet, and journalist. Um, and uh, interestingly, only one of these descriptions would actually have made sense in Christine's own day, um, but this is how she's hailed on this website. So my question is, how would the following story from the Book of the City of Ladies fit into this vision of Christine as a women's rights activist or as a woman who does not behave well? Uh, and this is the story of um, Julia. Uh, and the quotations I'm going to use from the Book of the City of Ladies appear on the handout that hopefully you have access to. I'll be talking about this um, story in some detail, so um, um, I'll read it aloud to you. So at one point in the book of the City of Ladies, uh, the persona Christine um, asked rectitude um, uh, about the common perception um, in 15th century um, France uh, that um, husband, men really shouldn't get married because wives are kind of a detriment to them. Um, and one of the stories that Rectitude tells that demonstrates the virtue of women uh, includes the following. So quotation one is the story of Julia, again, in which Christine is speaking to Rectitude, who's one of the allegorical guides in the book of the Sacred So, however, my lady, um, I've just remembered something that the ph philosopher Theophrastus said about women hating their husbands when they're old. Rectitude replied, come now, Christine, hold your tongue. I can immediately find plenty of examples which contradict these opinions and disprove them completely. In her time, Julia was the noblest of Roman ladies, being the daughter of Julius Caesar. She was married to the great warrior Pompey. This Pompey, though now elderly and decrepit, was at the height of his glory. Despite the fact that his wife, the great lady Julia, was still a very young woman, she loved her husband so deeply and so truly that she met her death in a very unusual way. It so happened that one day, Pompey went to make a sacrifice. During the ritual, Pompey was holding on to one side of the slaughtered animal as it was being laid on the altar, when his robes became splattered with blood from the creature's wound. He therefore took off the robe which he was wearing and sent one of his servants back to the house with it to fetch him a fresh, clean one. As luck would have it, the servant who was carrying the robe ran into Julia, Pompey's wife, who saw her lord's clothing all covered in blood. Knowing that those who distinguished themselves in Rome were often the target of the envy of others who attacked and sometimes killed them, the dramatic sight of her husband's blood convinced her that some ill must have befallen him. She was seized by a great pain in her heart as if she had suddenly lost all will to live. Being pregnant at the time, she fell to the floor in a faint, all color drained from her body, and her eyes turned up in their sockets. It all happened so quickly that there was no time to give her any help or to allay her fears before she expired. So, so a number of things I want to point out about Julia. Um, clearly she exists in a domestic sphere and she is praised as a virtuous wife. 
Also, Julia is remarkably passive. She is overwhelmed with her emotion. Um, and her feminine virtue is established uh, specifically in terms of her love for and devotion to her husband. This, by the way, is a model of female virtue, wives who virtuously love their husbands, that is fairly prominent in the book The City of Ladies. And Christine presents loving wives as an imitable model for contemporary late medieval women. So I wonder, what do we make of the story of Julia, and how does this fit with the idea of Christine de Pizan as a women's rights activist? Well, at least one scholar has challenged this view um, of Christine de Pizan. Um, Sheila Delaney uh, published an article back in the late 80s entitled Mothers to Think Back Through, Who Are They? The Ambiguous Case of Christine de Pizan. In this article, Delaney locates Christine within political, economic, and cultural developments in early 15th century France to come to the following conclusions. So here are a couple of quotations from her article. In a time when even courtiers and clerics wanted change, Christine continued in her quiet neoplatonic hierarchies and her feudal nostalgia. And regarding women and marriage in particular, Delaney writes the following. Though many women were their husband's partners, both domestically and commercially, Christine fears the implicit egalitarianism of such an arrangement, advising the married woman to submit humbly to whatever comes her way. Thus, Christine sees woman as domestically the angel of the house. Now, I don't actually agree with Delaney here, and if I think it's anachronistic to call Christine a women's rights activist, I think it's equally anachronistic to epitomize her stance on marriage through the Victorian concept of the angel of the house. So here's what I want to do in this talk. Instead of applying modern day or more recent concepts to Christine, um, angel of the house, a women's rights activist, I want to try to recapture some of Christine's specifically medieval concepts of women, love, and marriage and use them to try to think about our modern day culture. So again, instead of the usual move of trying to think of um, modern day concepts that we can use to make sense of Christine, I want to reverse the direction of that and ask, can we use Christine to actually help us think about more modern day phenomena? So I want to recover Christine not as a model to be either celebrated and emulated on one hand or criticized and rejected on the other. Rather, I want to recover Christine as a set of questions, as a me methodology to think about how she might help us consider issues facing women today. And the main question I want to arrive at this talk is the following. What constitutes a feminist discussion of love? So my talk tonight is in four parts. Don't worry, some of them are quite short. Um, and <laughs> I will begin with part one. Um, yes, love and marriage today. So in US culture, marriage has been the subject of debate, and we're living through profound changes as far as this institution is concerned. Uh, the heated issue of the last decade has been same-sex marriage. Undoubtedly, you're aware that earlier this week, the Supreme Court allowed rulings by state appeals courts upholding same-sex marriage to stand, which is a big event in the um, uh, legal proceedings as far as same-sex marriage is concerned. One thing that supporters and opponents of same-sex marriage frequently agree on is that marriage is a good, desirable institution that is based on the emotion of love. So that's something that interests me, is as, as, as heated as the debates have been over same-sex marriage, often proponents and, uh, and opponents think of marriage in fairly similar terms. So I want to quickly sketch out a picture of US attitudes toward marriage. I'm not going to present the research that these points are based on, but I'm happy to talk about that further if people have questions after the talk. There we go. So, U.S. beliefs about marriage. One, love is the foundation of marriage. Two, a loving monogamous relationship with two people, between two people is natural, the norm. Three, a loving marriage is good, desirable, and makes its participants better people. And four, we freely choose, or we should be able freely to choose, whom we love and whether we marry. Uh, some of these ideas are reflected in a book on marriage uh, by Jean Robinson, who is the first openly gay bishop of the U.S. Episcopal Church, entitled God Believes in Love, Straight Talk About Gay Marriage. So my concern is that as much as we talk about marriage and as much as we see love as fundamental to marriage, uh, we don't often actually talk about what it is that we mean by love. Um, and I actually think that's kind of important. There are a couple of reasons I think we don't address um, 
uh, what we mean by love. Um, one, I think, is that we assume that love is fundamental to human experience. So fundamental, in fact, that everyone knows what love is, everyone recognizes it, and you don't have to ask what love is. Uh, so, for example, in science fiction, um, uh, a common trope um, um, regarding aliens, um, robots, cyborgs, and such, is that um, they don't get love because it's something that's fundamentally human um, that is incomprehensible to them. <laughs> so here are a couple of examples. Aliens are befuddled by logical love, and even a homicidal replicant becomes sympathetic if you can love. So again, I think we have this idea, you know, humans just know what love is. Uh, a second reason I think we don't question what love is is because of the rhetoric of individualized choice in US culture. The idea being that every relationship is different, so what one person's loving relationship looks like might look different from someone else's. By the way, you may have realized that the idea that love is um, a fundamentally human quality and love is specific to individuals, that those two ideas somewhat contradict each other, but hey, that's how ideology works. Um, so, I actually think it is important to ask what love is, and the reason I do so is because of my work um, as a medievalist. So, part two of my talk, um, love and marriage in the Middle Ages. Um, I'll be using the Middle Ages as a shorthand in this talk to refer to the parts of the Middle Ages that I research, um, which largely focuses on um, the literatures of France and England, mostly in the late Middle Ages, the times for which are up there, although I will be referring some to the high Middle Ages to set up some of my ideas. So when we think about marriage in the Middle Ages, we often think that marriage was a loveless institution during this time period. In fact, in our popular views of marriage, we often sketch out a history of progress in which we supposedly um, uh, started with arranged marriages and loveless marriages in the past, and progress to um, our more enlightened, love-based marriages today. Um, and here's the cover of one popular history of marriage that subscribes to this view um, that 